Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Salutare! Salutare la toată lumea! Bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitatul nostru din seara asta e un savant cu reputație mondială, o personalitate care a făcut istorie în domeniul pe care îl cercetează. Doamnelor și domnilor, suntem onorați să-i spunem bun venit la Garantat 100% profesorului Paul Allen Cox. Hello, good evening, thank you for accepting our invitation. Pleasure to be with you, thank you. Uh, Professor Cox, what's an ethnobotanist? I mean, how can you combine in one and the same person an anthropologist, a botanist and a linguist? They are very different territories. These are all necessary skills to understand how indigenous people use plants. And I've spent about a third of my life mm -hmm. living in small villages, working with people from the Sami reindeer herders of Lapland yep. uh, to the islanders of the South Pacific, all looking at how they use plants for medicine, for food, for mm -hmm. the religion. It's a, it's a fascinating field, and I just feel very lucky to be able to do this work. Professor Cox, what is the definition of ethnobotanical science? I mean, what is it dealing with? Mm -hmm. Ethnobotany is the study of how indigenous people use plants. And so I study how they use plants for their diet, to make shelter, mm -hmm. to make clothing for the religion and particularly for medicine. Some people are very reluctant when you talk about this. They will say, how can you learn something from primitive people? End of quotation. How would you answer to that? 
The people I speak with, particularly the medicine people, I'm not just speaking to that person's knowledge, but I'm speaking to all their fathers, their grandfathers, their mothers, their grandmothers, generations of time. So this knowledge is accumulated. So, for example, when I'm in the islands of Samoa, mm -hmm. sitting with a Samoan healer, I'm accessing several thousand years worth of human knowledge that's accumulated through time. So it's a very profoundly humbling experience because the people I speak with mm -hmm. have generations of knowledge about the plants. How do you react when people pronounce the word primitive? Uh, yeah, it's not a term I like to use very much. And I tell my students, if you go into a village and you feel the people are savage or primitive or benighted in some way, they'll understand that and you won't learn anything. But if you go in and if you're humble, you want to learn, you want to understand, then the knowledge starts to flow. How many Polynesian languages do you speak? You know, I, I really haven't counted them. <laughs> I know that sounds a little silly, but uh, I, I mean, I'm bilingual in, in Samoan. I speak Tongan, uh, Tahitian, a uh, bit of Kapinga Maringi, a bit of Maori, but uh, really it's just about communication. And where I really love to uh, speak is about the plants, about the medicine. So you learn how to speak languages, you learn how to listen. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of languages I speak, people say I speak as a child because I learn by listening to children. If I speak to adults, they don't laugh when I make a mistake, but little children mm -hmm. will burst out laughing. So it's usually easiest to learn from children. It's just human curiosity. How did you manage to, I don't know, how did you manage your time to learn the languages, to research, to, I mean, to do your job? How did you do that? Well. First of all, I'm deeply interested in the plants. When I was a child, my earliest memory is of irises growing along the ditch bank, uh, about the texture of juniper seeds. Yep. Uh, I can't walk in a room without seeing the plants. My father was a national park ranger. My mother was a scientist. And I spent my uh, childhood, I didn't realize it was extraordinary. I do now, of course, but then uh, I spent most of my time in national parks, in, in wild areas. And so when I meet the people, uh, we share that in common with the indigenous people. The other thing that's quite interesting is I'm a religious person. Mm -hmm. And that actually helps bridge me to indigenous people. Because when they tell me the frigate bird is sacred to us, I can understand what that means. And I can respect that because I have a role in my heart for sacredness as well. And the one fascinating thing that every indigenous culture I've met told me is that the earth is sacred. They believe our planet should be protected as a sacred mm -hmm. place. They all agree on this one fact. That's very compelling to me. I'm pretty sure that some of our viewers can ask this question. How can this man, who's an important scientist, one of the most important scientists in the world, how can he be religious? I mean, it's not a match. Well, I, I just don't feel that way. I, uh, I don't personally sense any contradiction between science mm -hmm. and faith. I think science tells us how the world works, how things happen, but religion tells us why. And I, I, I had dinner one night with Rabbi Kushner, uh, who wrote uh, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, and I felt such ease speaking mm -hmm. to him. I said, well, how is it? I, here I'm a Mormon boy, yep. you're a, a Jewish rabbi, we feel, feel such compatibility. Uh, and he said, oh, Paul, he said, every human being has a God-shaped hole in their heart. They just try to fill it different ways. He said, you feel the wow. same way speaking to a Muslim, uh, one of my dear friends as a Catholic cardinal. I think that once we transcend these differences in faith, we, we realize that we share a planet in common. And we realize that this is a very special planet. With all of our research, we've never found any place like this place. It's incredible with the birds and the plants and the flowers. And I think good people everywhere feel there's a higher purpose for this place wow. and there's a special place for us to care for. Professor Cox, how did you get to Polynesia? I mean, what's the story of this central experience of your life? I was raised as a Mormon, yep. the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when you're raised as a Mormon, you know that when you reach 19 years old, you're going to get a letter from the church that sends you on a mission. I didn't know where I was going to go. I'd studied Russian language, so I thought maybe I'd go to Finland, 
The letter came, said Samoa. I got to Samoa. They sent me to the most remote island. My companion was learning English by trying to read the uh, King James Bible. They put me in the back side of this island in this remote village. I lived in a hut uh, on the beach. I used to get up at nighttime and help the men pull in their, their canoes. They taught me their language. They, I couldn't understand it. It sounded like booga, booga, booga. And they make me repeat this every day, every day, the chiefs. But when I started to understand, I realized they'd made me memorize their genealogies, their mm -hmm. proverbs. It was a tremendous gift because it's like learning English. You could either study the menu at McDonald's or you could learn Othello, okay? And they taught me Othello. So now when I speak Polynesian, I speak as a chief and I'm accorded that respect and dignity. And that really was my first Polynesian language and really helped me. You also have a certain symbolic position within the community of the Samoan Islands. <laughs> what's that position? I mean, what's the meaning of that? Yeah, this was tricky because uh, my, I was there with my wife and children mm -hmm. doing ethnobotany. It was fantastic. We lived a year, again, in a little hut next to the beach, no running water, no electricity. Our children each morning just would study their school books from America. I was studying with the healers. It was, it was a wonderful life. There's always time to visit with other people. Maybe there's rural places in Romania like this where really your richness is not your possessions, it's your relationships with other people. But everything came crashing when a logging company showed up, mm -hmm. started knocking down the rainforest. The people were weeping. I went to the chiefs, I said, why did you let this logging company come? They said, we're poor people, poor village. We have no way to pay yep. for our school. I said, what if I could raise the money? They sent two chiefs with machetes to chase the uh, loggers away. My wife agreed to sell our house, our car, um, so we could pay for the school, because I had just six weeks to raise the $85,000. I mean, did you sell it literally? Yeah. Well, wow. yeah. I, I, I asked my wife, I said, good news, we've saved a 10,000 hectare rainforest. Bad news, we have to sell car, house, maybe one of our children. I don't know, we needed to get money in a hurry. And uh, you know your marriage is working at a moment like that because Barbara took my hand, looked in my eyes, said, what a great opportunity, Paul. How often in our life will we get a chance to do this? Wow. So we started cashing out. Our friends and family in America found out. They all started pitching in, contributing. Other people helped. And so uh, six weeks later, I had $85,000. We purchased the logging rights. The villagers promised to protect their forest. Wow. 600 people walked with me into the logging company, said never come back. So they asked me to take this chief title called Nafanua. And I was very reluctant because this is the first thing you learn, you know, first semester cultural anthropology, do not become a native deity. <laughs> but it turned out this was an ancient person who came and told the people to protect their forest taught them how to use the plants for healing, and was sort of a cultural hero. Mm -hmm. And the villagers felt that I had acted in the same way, and so they call me now that name Nafanua, which is one of their ancient chiefly titles. What is prostratin? Prostratin is the drug we discovered with the healers that is now being developed as an HIV AIDS drug yep. in America. It's very exciting. It looks like it can clear people of HIV, clear the viral reservoir. But this came from knowledge from the indigenous people. And I was very proud of my government because they wanted me to sign the patent papers. I said, no, no, I learned this from these ladies. And they, so they agreed to have anybody developing the drug negotiate an equitable return back to the people. How did you discover it? I mean, what was the story of this discovery? Well, you know, my mother had died of breast cancer. Yep. And so, so I was yeah. actually looking for cancer cure. Um, didn't find anything that worked, but I was working closely with the National Cancer Institute in the United States. And then they rang up, and, or not rang up, but they wrote me a letter, which mm -hmm. I got. I remember sitting on the beach reading their letter. They said, do you have anything for viral disease? I remembered that this plant, a healer taught me, um, she said it could be used to treat hepatitis. I thought, well, maybe we should try this, and that's where we started. Professor Cox, how much indigenous knowledge is humankind able to preserve now i know you cannot answer precisely you cannot say uh, a precise quantity of knowledge but in systematic databases uh, 
or in any way that knowledge can be preserved and used. I mean, this is a huge heritage and a huge treasure. It's a huge treasure, but it's disappearing. Um, the reason is that I think in the Western societies in Romania, Sweden, United States, we're taught that knowledge exists in a book, knowledge exists in a library. That's right. I work with people where their knowledge is not written down. They acquired it from listening to their grandmother, their grandmother's mm -hmm. mother, and it's been passed down, and now the chain is being broken. So most of the people I work with are very elderly people. Um, I was very pleased in Sweden to launch a program in Sweden to send uh, scientists out into the rural parts mm -hmm. of Sweden to try capture just the folk knowledge of plants and animals. This has resulted now in eight volumes. But the danger is, is that this is disappearing very quickly, and we can put a number on this. Um, we know now that uh, at the millennium, about half of all human languages had vanished. And probably within the next 50 years, we'll lose about 85% of all human languages. Uh, the major languages, Hindi, Chinese, English, mm -hmm. the Slavic languages, Latin languages, they'll remain, of course. But small languages from little tribes are disappearing. And language really is like the container right. that holds folk knowledge. So as the languages disappear, people lose access to many aspects of their culture, particularly the medicinal traditions I'm so interested in. So it's really a race against time because unless we record these mm -hmm. people, record the knowledge, it'll be lost forever. What is the real power of botanical substances to cure serious illness? Mm. Well, this is where I've really focused my efforts. Um, we know that plants, for example, produce about 11,000 different families of chemicals. Mm -hmm. You take a typical leaf off a tree, yep. 4,500 different molecules just in that leaf, okay? And the plant can't run away. When the animal comes up to eat the plant, it can't run away, it can't hide. So the plants respond through chemistry. They mediate the relationships to the world through chemistry. So plants, and to a lesser degree, sessile organisms like corals, certain sponges, have this profound biochemistry. Mm -hmm. Many of these can be developed as drugs that can help us. And I'm extremely interested now, most of my work is looking at Alzheimer's disease, ALS, very serious life-threatening illnesses, because I'm- What's ALS? ALS, motor neuron disease. It's a paralytic illness that kills people within about two years. Uh, Stephen Hawking has this, he's lived very long. And uh, I've spent the last 10 years now going to villages that have high rates of this disease to try to discover new, new treatments. I mean, is it really working? Oh yes, I mean, if you go to any pharmacy, uh, mm -hmm. and pull any drug off the shelf, there's a 50-50 chance that that drug came from plants, most of which were used by indigenous people. It was really funny because I was giving a talk in Bangkok and uh, a famous uh, pharmacologist from Austria challenged me. He said, oh, Paul, you know, uh, we'd all love to go to these beautiful places and lay on the beach, and, but you know, it seems to me like you're trying to take us back to the dark ages. I said, well, actually, let's go across, Joseph, to the pharmacy across the street, and let's see how many drugs come from your molecular biology research versus mm -hmm, my way. Mm -hmm. He said, well, that's not fair, he said, because you know, we've only been doing this for uh, 10 or 20 years. I said, yes, but there's 10 or 20 million of you guys, and really there's only 25 or 30 ethnobotanists in the world. So it's a very powerful way. And I think people in Romania particularly understand this, because during famine, oh, yeah. during war, they can't rely on synthetic medicines. They have to go back to plants, just like indigenous people. On the other hand, there are lots of people having, um, how shall I call it, maybe a fundamentalist perspective on botanical medicines. People refusing chemical ones, vaccines, talking about international conspiracies to limit the number of individuals on this planet. I mean, where's the balance? What's the real relation in between chemical medicines and botanical ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, again, I'm a scientist. So when I discover drugs, they end up with, with, with doctors in the hospitals. I mean, simple things like uh, treating childhood leukemia. Yep. This uh, molecule, vincristine, comes from periwinkle plants. 
Aspirin is something that everybody uses that comes from a plant. I played a very small role in the discovery of Taxol, which is the major drug for treating ovarian cancer. So people often think, oh, because I spend my time out in villages, I'm sort of into alternative natural medicine. The answer is no, I'm into, if, if I succeed, you get this from your doctor, you get this from mm -hmm. the hospitals. So it's really a major engine of discovery for, for traditional pharmaceuticals. On the other hand, there's a whole industry of plant medicines. There's an industry sometimes very aggressive. Um, I will not be very sure that a part of this industry is honest. I will not be very sure of the fact that that type of medicine has inside it what it's written on the label. Um, what do you say about that? I, I think you're correct. Um, and I think the situation is worse in the United States than in uh, uh, Europe. For example, in Switzerland, uh, Sweden, Germany, uh, doctors continue to prescribe plants that have been carefully tested. There's a commission E in Germany that's mm -hmm. made very careful monographs and studies of which plants are allowed to be used. Italy's the same way. Um, so here, healthcare professionals can prescribe natural products directly to patients. They're, they're manufactured and under pharmaceutical standards. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we have this sort of fantasy. Uh, we call it, uh, these are, are nutritional supplements. Right. They're food. Right. And uh, that's sort of silly in a way because I think these should be regulated as normal drugs. So, but unfortunately, there's unscrupulous people who say, ah, oh, I have the cure for cancer here. Or, oh, this guy. That's what I was talking and, about. And, and yet, when we look at the science, there's no clinical studies. There's no careful preclinical workup. They don't even know what they're selling. And that I'm totally opposed to. Sir, so what is psychology? I mean, we have a short presentation film about this, but what is psychology? Well, when my wife and I started uh, this effort to build this school to protect this rainforest, soon after we finished, other villages started asking. We only had one house to mortgage. Um, so we started a not-for-profit to just protect our and our own friends' funds. But the idea spread. Uh, and then I got some industrial partners that agreed to contribute part of the sales if I developed cosmetics for them that would go into psychology. And um, pretty soon uh, it really took off and it's really fun. So the idea is we meet with indigenous people and uh, we offer them what they need, a school, a water supply, yep. a hospital. In return, they protect their rainforest or their coral reef. Um, I mean, we, Barb and I thought it was a big deal when we were able to do just one school. Now we've done 250. We have projects in, uh, I think, 55 different countries, focusing mainly on islands, mainly on islands. But it's been an awful lot of fun and, and very successful. So far, I think we've set aside uh, over a million and a half acres wow. of uh, rainforest and coral reef with the indigenous people protecting it. Psychology approaches island villagers and any island throughout the world and asks them what tangible thing they would like in return for setting aside a marine or forest reserve. And when I say tangible thing, I mean a school, a community center, solar heating system, a freshwater delivery system, something like that. And so it's just a fair and square deal. And the idea, like a lot of brilliant ideas, is so simple that it just dawned on all of us, really, at the same time, why don't we make this internationally? It works in Samoa, where Paul started it. Why wouldn't it work in Fiji, in Tonga, in, uh, in Madagascar? And in fact, it has. Psychology has really grabbed that idea, this idea of, of providing incentives directly to villagers, to, to, to the people who own this biodiversity, to conserve it. Um, and I think it's, it's a fantastic model, and it's something which the larger NGOs uh, increasingly will, will learn from. Well, psychology likes to work within the, within the parameters of, of each individual village's culture. These are the people who are, could be potentially the biggest threat but, the, but also the biggest hope for you know, any protected environment. 
So um, a lot of other uh, organizations or government programs usually go from the top down. It trickles down to the bottom, but then it kind of peters out. And a lot of the times the, the local people have nothing to do you know, with the protected area. And as a result, there's no ownership. There's no feeling of responsibility or even any knowledge of you know, what they're supposed to be protecting. Working from the bottom up, the people really do have, you know, they're involved in you know, choosing the area, delineating it. It's very simple. You, you, you cannot live without these trees, and you cannot live without the river. You cannot live without the reef, because they are part of you. Hutan dapat menjaga air, dapat kita tidak kekurangan air sekarang karena hutan di sini sangat aman dan kita tahu semua hutan dapat stop. I thank the psychology group for stepping in and trying to prevent our resources from being devastated. They come up with the idea of uh, allocating a particular place to be reserved, marine reserve, and uh, for the goodwill of that, they build a kindergarten. So thank you to the psychology group. This year I decided to go with Seacology because of the programs that they support in working with the indigenous people. And it makes, and actually going to villages and getting to know the people, culturally it's much more enriching than just going to a resort and just hanging out. This is, this is fulfilling. We're actually able to see up close and personal how our dollars have helped people. It's something you are actually feeling that you are a part of. As a younger generation, we really feel like Seacology has the potential and is doing a great service. We're able to snorkel in the marine preserve that's just been established a year ago and we're able to recognize that this reef seems like it really is indeed responding. We're seeing sharks and rays and amazing fish and lionfish and spectacular colors and coral reefs that are getting healthier. And I want future generations to be able to see those things. Mm -hmm. And Seacology mm -hmm. is helping to make that happen. And the villages that are partnering with Seacology are making that happen. And it's mm -hmm. really exciting. Islands are the ultimate biological hotspots. It's no accident that Charles Darwin discovered evolution by going to the Galapagos Islands. In some islands, 30% of the plant species are found nowhere else in the world. Right now, so many species are going extinct that future generations will be unable to tell the difference between our epoch and an asteroid hit in terms of mass extinction. So islands are sort of the front lines in fighting extinction. I'm very hopeful about the future of the Earth, the ecosystem, the environment, uh, because 30 years ago, it was just a fringe movement. Right now, it's so accepted. One of the reasons I have a lot of hope, uh, it's the children that are leading the way. The ch every, every country, we find that the children really understand the value of what we're doing. And then you have organizations like Seacology that come up with a cost-efficient, alternative way of approaching this thing, uh, a business approach, if you will, and you say, okay, this stuff can really work and uh, can spread throughout the world. Right now we're doing 20 to 25 projects a year. Why not do 250 projects a year? And we could do that without a great increase in staff size, just by increasing our part-time field representatives. Ecology's win-win. We're not there to change anything. We're just there to help. I mean, there's this connection, people to people, village to village, and that's what really the magic of psychology is. There's this sharing, and I just, I know it sounds silly, but I think that might be the secret 
to move in this world for I mean, We have shown that this model works in different geographies, different cultures, different religions, because it's based on goodwill, trust, and person-to-person -person communication, and that's the power of psychology. This is a bunch of naive, idealistic, wealthy Americans trying to find something to do to kill their time and spend their holidays in exotic islands, end of quotation. How will you answer to that? Yeah, I think I'm sort of, uh, compared to most of the world, I'm incredibly wealthy. I mean, this is true for all of us in Europe. You know, I mean, many people in the world have to live on less than one US dollar a day. Yeah. So that's a true statement. Uh, I'm idealistic, absolutely. And uh, the thing I really am idealistic about is I think if I save one tree, that really helps the planet. If I save two trees, better. If I can save a million trees, so much the better. So I accept this criticism. Yes, I'm an American. Because I'm a member of an industrialized country, I'm more wealthy than, say, 99% of the yeah. world's population. But instead of lay on the beach and drink beer, I'd like to actually use my efforts to try help indigenous people. And I've had a lot of fun doing this. This is not some uh, effort that's hard. It's an effort that's really fun. So well, I accept this mm -hmm. criticism. And uh, thank you very much, and I'll continue <laughs> to do this. <laughs> OK. Um, you will hear some people saying uh, something like this. The world cannot be saved, Professor Cox. It's created to disappear, to have an end, to perish. That is its destiny, to become extinct. Regardless of what man can do, the world has to end. So why worrying so much about that? You know, my favorite philosopher is the French philosopher Albert Camus. He wrote this lovely uh, essay called The Myth of Sisyphus. Remember, Sisyphus is the guy that has to roll the rock up every morning right. to the top of the valley, and then it just rolls back again. But he writes in The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus says, the struggle to the heights is enough to fill a man's soul. We must imagine Sisyphus is happy. I mean, protecting rainforest, trying to protect indigenous knowledge, championing indigenous peoples, this is hopeless, but it fills your heart. It's fantastic. And, and I love what Camus says, and we must imagine Sisyphus happy. I'm very happy. And if the world goes away in a million years, well, so be it. But for this time, if I can save one tree, if I can educate one child, if I can cure one disease, that's enough to make my life meaningful. Well, we saw all those films and documentaries about, um, I don't know, about Polynesia, about South America, about Amazonia. Um, really, in real terms, in realistic terms, can all this world be saved, literally? I mean, when you fight with international companies, um, with multinationals, is it possible for a group of human beings to stop what a real power can do? You know, I, I really believe this on different levels. I think planting a tree is a very radical claim. Right. You plant a tree seed, you are looking to the future. You're saying, I'm going to invest now in the future of this planet. And one tree reduces the carbon profile. You know, I uh, uh, went to uh, Adize in, uh, 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 outside Berlin, mm -hmm. which is the German Automobile Association, with some friends from Seacology. We said to them, why don't we carbon offset everybody driving this track? They agreed. I did this with my wife's car for her birthday. We put solar panels in a Filipino village and got rid of their diesel generator. And we figured out how much carbon we had stopped putting out. And we were able to sell shares in these solar panels to our friends. I bought enough to totally offset Barbara's car. So I actually feel that we can do this. If you plant one tree, that's yeah. great. What I would love to do, love to do, I would meet, like to meet the head of Lamborghini. And I'd like to say, why don't we offset, carbon offset, every Lamborghini you ever sell? And if you think about it, what does a Lamborghini cost? I mean, several hundred thousand euro, right? Offsetting the carbon from that just by planting trees or putting solar panels mm -hmm, in villages, mm -hmm. it only costs a thousand, two thousand euro. And then everybody could drive their Lamborghinis 
completely carbon neutral. And I predict this. I predict within 20 years, yep. every person on this planet will know their own carbon footprint. You will know exactly how much carbon, net carbon, you're putting out. And my goal is to provide ways that we can offset this. So would you join me in becoming carbon neutral? Would you plant some trees? Would you help me put a solar panel in? It's a fun way to live. And that way we can be on the planet and realize that we're not net carbon damage. We're actually helping. So I'm actually very optimistic. I can hear some of my compatriots saying something like this. Professor Cox is fascinating. He is right. But um, what happens when he leaves? What happens when some people lose hope? What happens when you say, well, it's worthless. Uh, I cannot change the world. How will you answer to that? I want to answer two things. Because I'm sitting in this historic studio, when some incredible things happened in December 1989, right. I totally became a believer that the world can change. Totally became a believer. I mean, my wife and I and children were in New Zealand. I saw what was yeah. happening in Germany. We flew in 1989. I had to be there to see what happened. That convinced us that we can change the world. But the thing that is the residual value is was I meet with children, and I listen to children. Children, this new generation, they're very focused on nature. Yep. They're very focused on love, on diversity. And all over the world I go, the little children want to plant trees, they want to protect nature, they want to embrace the world. And I think the world's gonna be in far greater hands when we go have the children. So Professor Cox, yes, I'm just one guy. Maybe I save one tree, maybe I help one disease, but these children are gonna change this place. I really think wow. the next generation is gonna to be totally different. And just look now at the recent Paris treaties on global warming. All of the nations of the world coming in together. The Kyoto treaties are the treaties in which more nations have signed right. than any other, any other treaty in the history of the world. So again, I'm very optimistic very optimistic that if we can save things now, the next generation will protect them and continue on. Sir, you also have a um, philosophical training background. Yes. Um, you are a scientist. Yes. Apparently, these are two contradictory territories. There are, these are two not antagonist, but very different territories. Um, please answer to some of my compatriots who are not preoccupied about the future, who have lost hope about the future. To people who will say that you have to live this very moment and we'll see afterwards. Is there an internal exercise? Is there any internal discipline in order to regain hope? I think looking at a sunset, looking at a flower, seeing a child smile, these are things that Scientifically, we can explain why the, why the colors change with the sunset. We can explain the hormones that cause the flower. Perhaps we can even explain the neurobiology behind a child's smile. But that is not sufficient. There's something incredible about being alive on the planet at this moment. And it's such a beautiful planet that speaks to me uh, great happiness. I mean, I believe, along with the indigenous people, that this planet is sacred. And if you are a person of faith, my view is then this really represents the masterpiece of an incredible artist. If you love the artist, don't slash the painting. And I love this idea that the indigenous people have that we show reverence by giving back something to the earth. Many of the Polynesian cultures, when you meet people yep. or you have a special ceremony, they give you a cup of kava, a sacred beverage made from this sort of tranquilizing plant. But when you take the kava cup, before you drink it, you pour a few drops back out on the earth. And then you drink, symbolizing giving something back. And this is what's been so fantastic for me as a scientist. So I've been meeting with some of the world's biggest corporations. Mm -hmm. I met with one, New Skin, $2 billion cosmetic corporation. Yep. I said, they want me to help them design some products. I said, I'll do it, but every time you sell a product, I want you to give something back. That's raised $20 million now for conservation. I mean, people want to do the right thing. I think our job as scientists is not to be negative, not to turn our back, but to embrace. I want to meet with the head of Lamborghini. I, you know, seriously, I want to meet with Vladimir Putin. 
I don't know who's going to be the American president, but I don't care who it is. I want to meet with that person. I want to say, let's give something back. Let's live our lives, but let's mm. live for something that's beyond our time. Right now, if we can protect the plants and animals, protect the beauty of this planet, if we can live lives of love and kindness, I think that's the most radical thing we can do. And I think it's a very sort of infectious disease. I really do. I think this, can, this sort of optimism is infectious. And, and again, I've been accused by colleagues of being overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. But hey, you know, I've saved a million and a half acres of tropical rainforest. I'm not to brag, but all the people that work with me, we've done this. We know we can do these things. Right. And uh, we know here sitting in Romania that we can change systems. I, I think we underestimate the power of our humanity. That's for sure. We underestimate our power in doing things. And this, again, why I always go back to Albert Camus. You know, his wonderful uh, book, The Plague, about a doctor just overwhelmed mm -hmm. trying to deal with the plague. And he says again, Camus, he says, we cannot all be healers, but we all do the effort. And that's my view. We, again, coming back to Camus on, on uh, the myth of Sisyphus, yep. the struggle to the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. If all you can do is plant one little flower in a flower box and put it outside your apartment, that is a statement. When you plant a garden, you are saying something about your belief in the future. When you raise a child and educate them, you're talking about yeah. futurity. This is not charity. This is investment in the future. And you're basically wagering the universe that that child, mm. that flower, that tree is going to make the world a better place. And I think that's a very good bet indeed. One more question from this position of the devil's advocate that yes, I please. had tonight. Of course. Um, some people may ask you something like this. Uh, and I always try to put myself into the shoes of some of my please. compatriots. Yes. Maybe somebody could say something like this. One of them could say something like this. Professor Cox, if I can plant a flower, is that filling my stomach? I mean, I live in a poor country, one of the poorest countries of the European community. Um, I keep listening to promises from the government. I have lots of problems around me. Uh, I would like to live in a more civilized way than I do, uh, but I'm not in a position of doing this. You can afford this because you're an American citizen, you come from a wealthy country, you can afford to speak like that. How would you answer to that? Uh, I, my uh, great professor at Harvard University was a wonderful man named E.O. Wilson, world's expert on ants. Yep. So one day, some lady calls in and says, I have these ants in my kitchen. I don't know what to do. What should I do about these ants? Professor Wilson said, well, you could study them. She said, why? Well, I said, yes, you could study these ants. You could learn about these ants. So this lady actually did this. She started studying the ants that are crawling through her kitchen, and she studied their behavior, their case structure. Professor Wilson helped her to write a paper which got published, totally new knowledge about these ants. So being able to look at a flower, I mean, I just came this morning from the cultural village here in Bucharest representing all of the houses right. from all over Romania. I mean, it was fantastic. So you've seen the village museum. The yeah. village museum. Yep. Yep was incredible. Our guide just lit up as he talked about this. I thought, what a beautiful country. Then I went and I looked at the little plants for Bascom Thaspis that was growing that I knew the Navajo Indians used to treat skin inflammation. You know, I looked at the Kelia millifolia they used to treat headaches. You know, I mean, you don't, it doesn't take money to plant a flower. So here's what I say, plant two flowers, eat one, give one to somebody else. And I think when you give something to somebody else, when you study, when you learn knowledge, yeah. if all you have are ants or cockroaches, well, study the ants, study the cockroaches. I have to tell you one, one, one really interesting Please story. Yeah. Okay, so Miriam Rothschild, Rothschild family, of course, very wealthy family. She is the world's expert on fleas, world's expert on fleas. She's done all these studies on fleas. So I had lunch with her at the Royal Society in London. I said, uh, 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 Miriam, why did you choose to study fleas? She said, Hitler made me do it. I said, how did that happen? She says, I was in Czechoslovakia during World War II. I was studying songbirds. The German planes came in, bombed the university. My experiments are all ruined. But I looked around. 
and there were a lot of fleas. So I thought, why don't I study those? So my wow. view is, and, I, and I'm not trying to be precious here, but any of us without money can see a sunset. Any of us can pick a flower up, yeah. smell it, enjoy it, and then hand it to somebody else. Any of us can smile. Any of us can help a small child or help somebody who's, who's, who's sad. I think by giving, we actually become greater. And I think that's the great paradox that the Buddha talked about, that Jesus talked about, that Muhammad talked about, that we become greater when we give of ourselves. And in that way, we find out who we are. Professor Cox, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's been a privilege to have you here. Honored to be with you. Thank you so much for welcoming me to this historic studio. Thank you. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de noi, le mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Ne vedem data viitoare. Noapte bună!